All right, so welcome to Shank, Shivs, and Sheaves Technical Primates. Um, I'm Ian White from Specialist Circumstances. I'm Morgan Atwood from BFB Labs. So um, we're both knife makers and have been for several years. And of course, we're also knife users, both for self defense and for utility. We're mostly going to focus on self defense applications or combative applications today. Next slide. So, knife is basically mankind's second oldest tool. The first one being the hammer or club. Once I figure out how to do something to break something else, make it sharp, pointy, you get the knife. Now, they have some really, really old examples of knives. From simple shards all the way up to much more refined examples. Don't be this guy. This is a Roman soldier. I uh, dug up in France. That's a large Gallic knife buried from one side of his skull to the other by some very angry Gaul. Um, probably about 50 BC. Probably lethal. Likely to cause it. Next one, please. Uh, so carry systems is what we're going to touch on first. And they've been carried in a lot of different ways. What you can sort of barely see, because of the somewhat terrible lighting here, is actually the dagger from that Otzi, the ice, ice man, was carrying. He had a woven reed sheath for it. You see that he carried that on his, on his waist? On his waist, yeah. yeah. Either on his waist or on the strap of the bag. So he was carrying a knife that far back in a sheath. And what we've seen ever since then is basically just variations on the same thing, whether or not they've been open carried or concealed, well, depends on society and culture. Different different periods have accepted open carry of knives, in some cases very large knives. Other periods, like now, don't really like it if you walk around in public with a knife exposed. The most socially acceptable in circles where it is socially acceptable is often just the pocket clip. You know, there are very few so circles where it would be acceptable to walk around with even this exposed. The only one that really comes to mind is cowboy culture. Uh, cowboy culture, a lot of guys are actually carrying a knife right here with the edge upward so that they can cut their way out of something like an entanglement on a saddle or with a rope or something very quickly and strongly. But cultural appropriateness of carrying a knife openly is not really, we're not really in an era where it is culturally appropriate. People can freak out, which deems a need for concealment. You have to carry it where it's at least obscured or in some way not obvious to people who are around in the environment. Absolutely. Now, we do see some some changes in culture as well. For instance, the Spanish Navajo folding knife actually came about because they made it illegal to carry a fixed blade. So they started making folding knives. Big folding knives. Really, <laughs> really large ones. Uh, some of them with 12 inch blades. Oh yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, some huge folding knives. Um, those are actually some of the first locking folders as well. Interesting history bit there. Uh, next slide, please. So, methodology. What we need today, for the most part, is concealable ways of carrying the knife. Um, some of the things that we see over and over again that, that knife makers and manufacturers seem to be wrong is that they don't seem to understand the need for being able to access the knife reliably and quickly from concealment. And it's kind of the same paradigm that that's, well, concealed carry of a pistol. You need to be able to establish a full fighting grip on a pistol right from the get-go. The exact same thing applies to a knife. If you have to fumble with it or change your grip or dig it out of something, it's probably not ideal. Um, and that's, I don't know why we see so many knife makers actually get that wrong. It, it's not hard. We wouldn't, for the most part, when you talk about holsters and fighting guns. Nobody really accepts a holster where you have to compromise part of your grip at the outset of the draw and then adjust your grip. Most basic classes, most basic conversations on carrying a handgun, appropriate holster design, we'll talk about you need to be able to establish that full grip high in the tank, get your fingers locked all the way around it at the very outset of the draw. But you'll see time and again knife makers, whether they're custom makers, production companies, 
making sheaths that in no way support this. They cover a large part of the handle of the knife. So what you end up doing is having to use the weakest part of your hand, or even if drawing the reverse grip, only part of your hand to establish a sort of pinch grip, and then you have to get the rest of your hand around it. It is less than ideal. So, why, you have why, a question? Why do you think so many knives come like that? It seems like for most manufacturers and knife makers, the sheath is kind of an afterthought. Like, oh, I made this knife. Uh, well, here's a sheath. Largely. It's a lack of pressure testing as well. Yeah. Even in, in knife makers who specialize in combative designs, you don't see a lot of these knife makers doing things like Craig Douglas's EWO or ECQC or Paul Sharp's MDOC, where you're getting a lot of reps under pressure accessing tools over and over and over again. They don't know the flaws because they've never gotten into a pressured environment where those flaws become evident very quickly. Or they're training with knives. Or they're doing suboptimal the training. But again, they're doing training that doesn't pressure test in any more way. Uh, so a number of ways of accomplishing, like attaching the knife to yourself. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you guys here have seen tech locks before in various forms, uh, various types of clips, soft loops like the inside the waistband loops from Blade Tech and other places, uh, which is something we have there. Uh, Tom Kelly from Dark Star Gear uses those too. He's in the back, can't see him on camera. Um, and some of those are good, others not so good, at least in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of tech locks. I think they're huge and bulky and just annoying and not comfortable. So I tend to not use them. At the most basic attachment, what you end up seeing is just a belt hanger, something the belt slides through that the knife hangs off of. Largely, this is unacceptable for any kind of combative use or anything where you need to conceal the knife. For a field knife, hunting knife, something like that, it can be perfectly acceptable because you have time to take both hands, stabilize the sheet, and draw. But just a simple hanger doesn't really control where the handle of the knife is at the moment you need it. That's one of the things to look for in an attachment system is does it keep that knife in a fixed place where every time you go to grab it, it'll be exactly where you want it to be. If it doesn't do that, it's not a good attachment system. The other problem is a lot of attachment systems end up adding bulk. So you have a relatively thin sheath with a very bulky attachment system. Again, like the tech lock, adds <coughs> half an inch at least to everything you put it in. Lots and lots of standoffs, just makes it print um, Obviously a sheath should retain the knife appropriately. You don't want it to come out when it's not supposed to. But at the same time, you also don't want it to, well, be so difficult to, be, to draw from the sheet that you hang up. You want a nice, sort of smooth draw. You don't want to have to firmly tug and then have it come free. You want to be more. Move your belt the whole way around. Yeah. I know I've done that a few times. Um, another thing that you see a lot is sheets that are way too big, it's way too much excess material. Again, this is something that impedes yeah, being able to conceal it. Huh? Did you guys slide on the good? Yeah, actually, uh, try hitting the next one. Yeah. yeah. So, that's you see, the edges of this piece are here and here, but the width of the knife is only right there. So you've got a half inch at least of material on either side of the sheet. In the blade, where actually your finger coil is, is right here, but the sheet continues all the way up half the grip of the knife. Right. So you're, you're basically, you're, I mean, this is this set up on somebody's drop legs. But he's planning on being able to access that probably as a weapons retention thing or something. And more than half of the grip is up here. Don't be that guy. Because he's going to be fumbling with it and he'll probably end up dropping it or not getting it as an ideal grip. So, yeah, don't do that. Take away 
a lot of this material, use smaller rivets, and still be able to use a smaller rivet set and move this in, and still be able to mount it in a fairly versatile fashion on whatever you needed to. In the present sense, it would take away this much height exercise on a knife you already own, if you're modifying the sheath, or if you're a knife maker building it. It's not hard to have a sheath fully cut away so you can get a full grip on the knife. A lot of knife makers and sheath makers build their attention right in here, and they want a lot of material right in there to hold the knife firmly. You don't need it. You don't have to have that giant catch in there fully blocking this part of the grip to be able to retain the knife. The retention on this comes from just a slight lip right there, and then from just tension in the body of the sheath being tight against the blade. That's all you need. I carry this every day. I've done combative training with a trainer in a very similar sheath. Doesn't come out until I want it out. You don't need these giant locking bits of kydex to fill half the grip, keep the knife in place, even during vigorous activity. Running, kicking doors, whatever it is, it's unnecessary to have that level of retention. The only place where it might be necessary to have that really aggressive level of retention would be in a jumping situation. If you're jumping out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute, you need something that is jumpable. As my understanding, that's two points of retention, both tight and yeah. the strap. But that's not you most just, people's concept. You could still do that without you know, something like that. Yep. You just make a strap that you have put on when you're jumping and you tuck the strap away and you do not. Huh. It's like so. this. This uses active retention on the blade from a Kydex insert and then retention on the handle, but that can just easily be folded back around and snap it behind, and you have access to the hold of the handle to establish a full grip. And speaking of handles, move quickly along uh, into handle design. So, next slide. So, again, it's some, something of an area that I certainly feel there could be a lot of improvement. Um, some knives definitely um, are not ideal for combative, combative applications, especially because of the handle design. Um, others are a lot more suitable for it, like actually that one right there. This is a perfect example. Terrible handle design? Terrible, terrible handle design. Well, this is... Uh XSF punch dagger from Blackhawk Knives. It's designed to be used as a push dagger held in the fist. It has several things wrong with it. In terms I heard somebody of chuckle. Yeah. <laughs> um, to stabilize this style of knife in the hand, for one thing, you need more width to the actual part that stays inside the hand so it can rest against the bone and muscle structure of your hand here. This does not. It needs to come back to there. The long tang doesn't allow for that because when your hand is closed tightly, all you do is push the knife out. And you've still got all this room. I can actually get my fingers behind this in a fist, which means you kind of have to hit against my fingers and then drive back before it's ever stable in the hand. Then you have this long tang, which without any support back here particularly, means the knife, under any pressure at all, can easily just yaw around in the hand. So when you punch something, you can just have it rotated right out of your hand. And of injuring yourself, and the, yeah. Yeah. it's just not. That, that concept of appropriately filling the hand and having the right amount of leverage for you to do what you need to do with the knife, but not have it <coughs> levered out of your hand or twisting in the hand, that applies whether you're talking about something specialized like a push dagger or something that you're gripping more conventionally like or reverse edge knife. This is the Disciple, which you've worked with. No Those are on has an edge on the top side. Reverse edge combative so methods. This is another reverse edge knife designed by. Uh, Amsler. What's his name? Uh, anyway, a custom knife maker named Amsler. This is made by Poker. They're obviously very different in size, although the handle width is only slightly different. But, whereas this has a handle that is broader, that is thick, handle on this is almost as thick as it is wide at every point. 
when I grip this and I apply pressure, I can turn this, even in a full grip, in my hand, all the way around to provide no support. It's not wide enough, and because it's essentially round, it's the same dimension on every side, there's no support there to keep it from yawing. This, on the other hand, because it's just slightly wider and is not as thick as it is wide, I can, but it takes more force. It takes more force than I'm going to generate sticking that in somebody and ripping it through. And this would be an even better example of a hand flip grip. So in this one, you obviously have a much wider scale. And that flat helps stabilize it in your hand. It would be almost impossible for me, if I'm gripping this, to actually make it rotate. So I'm always going to know which way he has to point as far as that goes. It also has a substantial finger chore, which helps you stop wrench you basically from sliding up on the blade if you do hit something hard. And that's something that, again, you see this sometimes on combative knives that have almost no forward finger chore or guard of any kind. And that just screams hand surgery. Because you're going to stab something with it and your hand is just going to slide right up the blade. Even though people are, by and large, softer than anything made out of metal, let's say you're working your thrust and you hit the guy's belt buckle button and stuff. Or a magazine. Or anything. anything. You know, his magazine. Let's say you're, talking, you're dealing with somebody who's been in the prison environment and is aware of its weapons, and he's got a phone book stuffed under his shirt. And you think, oh, it's a gun. And you slam your hand into that phone book with an improper handle, and you go from here to there while you're gripping down as hard as you can, and that's sliding through your hand. It's not going to help your situation. Not much. You will. Regardless. One of the things to keep in mind, everybody has different hand sizes, and different knives are going to fit different people's hands differently. Something that fits my hand very well might not fit your hand very well. But the general concept of having appropriate dimensions regarding width and thickness and appropriate in terms of how it shapes to the hand, not having anything digging into the hand, those are pretty universal. If you find something that is the right size and has that right width to thickness inside that's right for your hand, you're, you're doing well. And in some cases, it just means trying different stuff. You know, it's a lot easier, honestly, to find a knife with your hand that is like a gun. And probably more important as well, you can work with a gun that's not comfortable in your hand. I was talking with John Donson about this, actually. He was talking about how much he hates the way he locks feet. He shoots them better than anything. Yeah. Despite the fact that they bite the crap out of them. Yeah. With knives, you want something that actually is going to feel good in the hand because it's telling you that your hand is locking into it. The biomechanics of how your hand is fitting around that grip are stronger than something that doesn't feel good in your hand. Something that feels uncomfortable, something that feels like pushing your hand out or like you don't have enough meat to grip. Um, uh, so, talking about slippage. Shape is one thing, but another component of that is also texture. Texturing can be accomplished in a number of different ways. Um, usually, with most knives you see today, you're talking about like G10, micarta, or something like that. And there's all sorts of different ways you can texture it. You can do grooves, you can do what I do a lot with my knife is dimpling. You have um, milling, three pretty milling. texture, three dimensional milling. Yeah. Um, injection molded handles, you see a lot of injection molded handles, they will have dimpling molded into them in some regard, or molded. Like a spider also. Yeah, that's uh, the bench main actually. Oh, but, oh, that's right. Yeah, molded in texture for grip. You also see rubber handles of various sorts, which I'm not a huge, huge fan of, but you will see they have texture molded into them. Now there's, there's on rubber handles, there's a right way to do them and there's a wrong way to do them. Cold steel does them wrong. So if you have a cold steel, don't be surprised if the handle starts. So. It is so. If that handle starts cracking, that's because it's only held on at the very end of the handle with that brass tube. This is one of cold steel's rubber handles. This is push tech. It doesn't even have the tube because it's relying on a tang. It's a T-shaped holder. But this rubber over time begins to break and crack. And without that rubber, all you have is a very small handle that's nowhere near what would 
fit your hand. You can take that, you can take those handles off of the razor. Yeah, you slice them right off. They get torn up. That's one of the problems with rubber. Rubber handles are soft, environmental stuff, just daily wear can wear on them, it can tear them up, put big gouges in, it's not uncommon to see a rubber handle carry knife that has big gouges taken out of that rubber just from knocking around. This would then be the exact opposite. This is how you would actually do that, right? This has a rubber handle, but it's placed over a, a hard plastic frame. It's then bolted to the tank in two places. This is probably not going to come off as you hit it with a You may see degradation over time again, but it would never be, never be as bad. Never going to be the of having handles that's fully degraded on it to come off. Yeah. Old steel doesn't come off. Just feel great. One of the things that you can do in terms of texture is if you have an injection mold with your plastic handle knife that's smooth, you can stipple it the same way if you would stipple a block. You see people take polymer pistols and they do stippling on them. Sorry, that's all I did with this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we already touched a little bit about on push daggers, on handles and so on. Um, again, one of the things Cold Steel is actually known for is their push daggers. But I'm not a big fan of them mostly because most of them, the tang is again too long. And the handles tend to, because they are kind of soft, they tend to want to rotate in your hand and you tend to hit something you are. The push dagger is pretty popular right now. Uh, a lot of people are starting to see the utility and value in having something that's very compatible with the striking platform and it's very easy to access. Simply locking your hand around this and pulling is a very simple means of accessing a tool. It's very reliable under pressure. It's starting to see a lot of people carrying push dagger to push dagger variants and they're getting more popular in combative circles. But like Ian was saying, there's a right way and a wrong way to build the handle. Most of the push daggers they see being built, particularly from production companies, have poorly designed handles. They don't, as I was saying earlier with this Blackhawk, they don't fill the hand appropriately. The tang is too long. Very things. The other thing you sometimes see the skiing blade is the lower on push daggers. You often see that the blades are too long. You don't want the blade that's much longer than a couple of inches. This is a trainer version of one line. Just passing it around. Um, you will see a lot of people will pick up a push tag and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to put it like this. Again. Seems fairly intuitive, but that's the right way to do it. It's in the middle of your I just started doing it. I, I just started doing it this one. Yeah, exactly. The problem is that it doesn't actually line up very well with your punches. So if you look at the way it actually straight wrist and see how it points off. See that point? It's a little bit down. It's not in line with bones in my arm. See the difference? You guys see how that lines up instead versus that? So that is, to I'm some punching. extent, I've met people who have slightly different hand shapes between these fingers, but the point does align with the bone structure of the arm and the hand. Pretty good. But they're an outlier. I've met a couple, but they're a serious outlier. For most people, for most use, you want it between the index and the index. That's the other thing is also if you, you are going to be using a push dagger from a punch, a punching platform, a striking platform. Most punches are going to move some kind of arc. Usually that direction. You don't want point about that one. Almost all thrusting with the knife to some extent moves in an arm. You really can't move your arm in a straight line past a certain point. If I'm thrusting in reverse grip, I can move this knife from here out to about here in a straight line. I'm already starting to keep my wrist. I'm starting to roll that wrist backwards. Continue that, my arm is hinging outwards. And this hinge here moving in a curve. Here it's moving in a curve. You can't thrust in a straight line more than just a short distance. So you need to think about that in terms of how the knife lines up and how it lines in your hand, where that point is going to be sitting. You're moving in an arc even on a straight thrust. If you're not, you have to start angling your wrist, and even so, you're still still arcing that thrust. Yeah, so a couple of sort of this portion right here 
You can either call it the neck or the tang. That's the obviously the part that protrudes out between your fingers. If that was too long, like on this lovely black hawk, you get what we talked about before. You can see the difference here is black hawk is just a little bit longer, maybe a quarter inch longer. But the neck itself is more than twice as long as the neck is on the Dominus push dagger here. And that's a lot of handle with almost no, or a lot of lever with almost nothing to work against it. And that's the other portion. Is this needs to be deep enough or wide enough to fill your hand. That flat surface is what prevents it from being yawed back and forth in your hand. So it has to be both a relatively short tank and a wide or deep enough handle to stay in one place. You don't want it to move around, you don't want it to pitch back and draw with when you punch something. And that's like something like this. Whoever made this, designed this, has probably never hit anything with any kind of power. My <laughs> Shh. Be nice. Maybe. No. My name. This is just, I mean, it's, it's never been used with any kind of power against them, any kind of resistant target. Like you, might have, you might have punched in cardboard with it. So, you, if you read a lot or you read a lot about these things, or if you do it in the future, you might come across an article from an instructor that I won't name who didn't design this, where he's talking about proper grips for this and for other tools. And one of the grips he talks about for push daggers is this, that you can stab somebody or cut them just like you would point your finger. Anybody see a problem with this? Yeah. That's how I do my finger death punch, dog. Don't, don't hate them. Exactly. You can't yeah. hold on to it. Dim knock. Uh -huh. I can stick it at the table, but it moves in my hand incredibly. It's too hard. You want, with anything, that full fighting grip. You want your hand wrapped around it. You want to be gripping it tight. You want your thumb down, fingers in, just like a fist. That's your ideal combative grip. That's the place we're coming from when we're talking to you about what we're looking for in grips, what we're looking for in how the handle lets you hold on to it. Yeah. Some people do prefer, and I'm, I'm honestly okay with it if you do, I have some issues with putting your thumb on the back of the blade, but if you do that, it's still basically the same grip qualities that you're looking for in being able to wrap these fingers fully around and have this fill your hand. The problem with this is it leaves a large opening here and it's kind of weak. But if you do that, you're still looking for the same overall grip qualities that we're talking about. And that, that's, I, I'm not a big grip in that grip at all. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, yeah, if you want to have more control over the blade from utility work or something, sure. The problem is that that thumb is a large portion of your grip strength. If you are using a knife defensively, you're probably not tickling him with it. You're probably trying to basically ram it into the spine from the front. It's a big strider. Yeah. And doing this with some sort of foil grip or whatever I've seen a bunch of instructors do, like, you want to stab somebody like this and he's trying to kill you? You're holding it like this. How many ways is my grip compromised here? This way? I'm not going to be able to hold on to it if I get any kind of force put on the spine of the blade. Same thing even with this way because my thumb is just going to lever it. When you lock your hand down, this is the strongest grip you can make as a human being. Not like some other instructors will tell you that, oh, it's in your pinky. Pinky is the strongest part of your grip. There, there are Somebody didn't read very about popular text, combative knives and sheathing options out there right now that are built around the idea that your pinky, your ring finger, and to some extent your middle finger are the strongest part of your grip and that your draw should be built on those. You'll see these sheets cover a large part of the handle, and what the instructors and designers expect you to do is close this part of your hand around the grip, and then pull with that, and then close the rest of your hand. 
they insist, and you'll see people doing this almost anywhere in various publications online, they insist that this is the strongest part of the grip. Probably no study I have found yeah. supports that. Not a single and medical study. You can, you can easily look this up yourself. Handle. I mean, just Google it. I know it's kind of a cliche these days, but seriously, just Google studies on hand strength. And it comes biomechanics up. just does not support that assertion at all. There's the single study that says, oh, well, your strongest part of your grip is your pinky and your ring, I mean, your, your ring finger. I don't even know where they got that from. So anybody that says that just automatically assume that they're probably not that well researched. Uh, yeah. um, any questions, comments yeah. on handle design, what we've talked about so far? Anything we haven't covered that you're interested in knowing regarding? Ring knives? Oh, yes, ring knives. Ring knives okay. and capsule knives. Ring knives and capsule knives. Let's talk about those. Where is the line? Right there. Okay. So there are various types of knives available that use a handle design with a ring at the back end. Um, the karambit is one of the more popular variants, for those who aren't familiar. It has a ring at the back end and typically a curved slashing blade. Um, there's a right way, kind of, and a wrong way to do ring knives. Any ring knife has a couple of problems. Um, one, access under pressure is problematic when you have to get part of your hand, a finger or a couple of fingers through a capsule of some kind. You've got the hideaway right there. Um, that knife is designed to use two fingers and two fingers only. It locks into the hand very, very well and for a ring or a capsule design it's fairly accessible because you just dive those two fingers in there and draw. But if you miss in any way, you end up with one finger in, one finger out, it's not as reliable as simply being able to close your hand around the handle and pull and go to work. Then the problem becomes you now have your fingers or a finger isolated inside this ring and if anything happens that dynamically moves that knife in your grip, your finger is now subject to whatever torsional forces that ring can apply. I'm not so concerned about breaking here, I'm actually concerned about a type of injury called deep loving. A lot of these rings don't have really round, smooth edges. They're just kind of squared off metal or plastic, you know, polymer. A degloving is what happens when you have something around the finger like this or around the limb even, and it applies enough force to separate the tissue, at which point the tissue just peels down like a banana peel. This is why machinists with all their fingers intact don't wear wedding, wedding rings when they work. So, uh, Deep lovings are nasty. They will also seriously impede your grip and your ability to continue using the knife in a combative fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, this, could, this could happen. I mean, you even see this. There was, was an injury recently, well, just a few months ago, with a guy that wore his wedding ring dur during uh, jiu jitsu. And a complete emulsion or degloving mm -hmm. of his ring finger from a wedding ring. And wedding rings, in my experience, so usually a little bit smoother. Yeah, they usually have. And say for something made. like the sock P you got. Yeah. This is what I have in my hand is the, the sock P, the Special Operations Advantage Program dagger designed by Craig Thompson. Craig Thompson. Uh, this is made by Benchmade. The original variant was made by Spartan Knives, who still make it under their own name for it now. Um, it has a very sharp 93 corner on the interior of this ring, um, both on the trainer and on the live blade as well. Not radius at all. Comparing that to, this is a Emerson Knives version of Fred Perrin's Le Grip design, which uses instead of a rear ring, a forward ring. This has quite a bit of radiusing on the interior of the ring. Actually, too much because it creates a pointed ridge instead of something rounded. But it's Better than having that very, very sharp edge. This style of knife that uses the index finger through the middle part, or if you insist, pinky ring through the middle, has some advantages when done right. One of the things is, is it can't be done so that you can grip this knife just like this and you don't have to get your hand through the ring. The problem becomes with this, you have no real stop, it's just smooth. 
But there are some ring knife designs that are not dependent on you getting that finger in the ring to have good retention and have a good grip. If you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. You're still very married to the knife, but if you have, this has been modified to the scale, if you have a grip that fills the hand and prevents some of that rolling and twisting, you now have something that you're locked into very well, you can do a lot with. One of the things a lot of people seem to be stuck on is the idea of knife disarm. If there's anybody here who thinks they're really, really good at knife disarms and wants to take this out of my hand, they're welcome to try. <laughs> no. Um, I still am not a huge fan of designs that enclose my fingers or a finger with knives. Particularly not when those designs make that enclosure dependent on drawing a knife. Going back to the sock feet. If you notice, this sheet covers the entire body of the knife. So to access, the only thing you can do is put a finger through there and pull. The design is supposedly based on soldiers, special operations personnel in combat overseas having problems with knife grab. Operator job. Operator job. People grabbing the knife off of their kit, taking it and hurting them. The idea here is to have something that's a minimal grip that doesn't appear to be a knife handle, it's going to be harder for somebody else to reach out and grab and pull, but that somebody can get onto and pull quickly. Now, admittedly, it's fast. You can, once your finger's in there, it's pretty quick. Several problems. With this mounted on armor, on your equipment somewhere, it's very flat. Getting a finger actually through there requires pushing against whatever's behind it to create a bit of an offset, and you end up with it perched on your finger rather tenuously. Now do it with gloves on. With gloves on, this is not a very large ring. You might not get even that far in there. You might end up doing this, at which point, if you have this very tenuous grip and you're moving because you're pulling this because, well, obviously your long gun or your handgun are down or somebody's closed on you so much that they're inside of that long gun and have moved it off the line somehow. So you're, you're not doing it slow, you're doing it in a hurry, you're moving, somebody's crushing in on you, well, and you. Yeah. you don't have anything there to hold on to. If you try and close your fingers wrong and you push that off the end of your finger, then what? Sure, it's close. Hopefully they'll fit. They look like it. So, since most people in these environments wear some form of tactical glove or shooting glove, Let's look at fairly well how that changes. This material here, even good fitting gloves that fit tight, add material to the very tip of the finger, that gets in the way of the ability to get in there and get on that ring. It adds to the width of your finger. It also creates something that you can get hung up on. If you end up with the ring just perched on the material of the glove while you're trying to grip it, more problems you see. What matters worse, of course, there's almost no real grip on that. And then there is yeah. no real grip on this design. You see that with a lot of ring handled knives. They <coughs> say, that, well, with the ring, retention is not an issue, so I don't know how you had those rings together, so I'm going to let you do it. So you don't have to worry about having a full grip. The ring does everything. You don't have to have anything that fills the hand. Well, with this, one of the problems is that sits very inconsistently in the hand. It ends up twisted, particularly if you move it, instead of having it back here, if as the designer says it's appropriate to have it on this knuckle, that knife can end up sitting in a variety of ways in the hand. If you have a very slashing dependent weapon, and it's sitting kind of cockeyed, you may not have the effect you intend. Um, one of my other big problems with this and other ring knives as a weapons retention tool or a tool to mount on armor is, let me get to come around here real quick. Let's say you've got somebody encroaching on you very, very quickly and very, very violently, and you put your finger in this ring and he slams into you. Even if I am not impeded in drawing, if he just hits this hand really, really hard while I'm trying to get this knife out, I've got this finger in a perfect position for him to break it. Just slam into it, impede my draw, smash my hand, and stop what I'm doing. Also good at me. Yeah. And then at that point, I'm locked into this damn yeah. knife, 
if he can control what I'm doing. All I have to do is keep the pressure on it, and now it's locked into the knife as well. Yes, and I end up having to do stupid shit because I'm stuck in my knife. It's not an ideal combative situation where you just grab the knife, put the point out, and start working. Even with a knife like this, you have much the same problem, and you have to get that finger in there, and it's trapping you onto that handle instead of you being able to control the handle, the handle starts controlling you to some extent. Not a huge fan of ring knives. A lot of people seem to really like the karambit designs and the sock P design because they can be deployed quickly because you can put a finger in the ring and draw and it feels very, very fast. With a folding knife, like a lot of folding karambits that have some kind of a deployment device on the blade that snaps the blade open when you draw it, I can see the attraction of having to be able to just put a finger in and pull and close your hand, but you still have all the aforementioned issues of a ring with the finger trapped in it. First line of thing, if you're going to do a ring knife, the, the hack or hideaway knife is probably one of the better versions of it, just because it's also very small. Yeah, here, and there's not a whole lot of as small knives go. Get having a lot of leverage, having a good handle that gives you a lot of grip is rare in small knives. The hack is one of the few that actually succeeds at that. I will say, for the record, I cannot at this point in time recommend going to hideawayknife.com and buying a hideaway. The odds of you ever getting your product are slim to none. It varies drastically. Yeah. If you really, really want one, I don't remember the name of it, but there's a, essentially a knockoff design, but the guy actually delivers knives. Some people pay money. I'm in China, but yeah. But they're also 90 bucks as opposed to like 300 Yeah. And you get them. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so the same thing basically applies across the board to all knives, even little ones. The whole idea is to get as much grip as possible on a knife. So, anybody here familiar with thumb daggers, a la World War II Special Operations, World War II Combatives? I think at least Chris should be guys like jumping up and down. Maybe. Small hideout knives designed to be very concealable, but to give you some opportunity to affect an escape. The traditional design for these knives is to have typically a dagger blade and a very straight handle with no real gripping features. Very problematic because you have nothing there to hold on to and you've got this very, very small surface that you're trying to grip. If you want a knife like that that works, something that has an asymmetrical handle, like this, that allows you to actually pull tension with your fingers and pull it into your hand and get a good firm grip on it that's more stable, not perfectly stable, is the ideal if you want a very, very small thumb dagger type hideout. Who's, who's the maker of that one? That's Ian. That's one. It's just a G10 piece. It's something I just sort of knocked out for the helmet. Okay. But it's surprisingly comfortable, so why not? Uh, probably not going to be killing anybody no. in any kind of hurry with something that small. So, you know. A small knife is essentially an adjunct to a practical arm combative platform. You're doing more damage, but you're not necessarily affecting lethal damage with the knife. It's simply putting a sharp thing behind everything else you're doing. You are fighting with any knife if you're using it combatively, but particularly with a tiny knife. Violence of action is the rule. If you have a problem with the idea of using this to scoop somebody's brains out, you probably shouldn't carry anything, but to use something like this, you have to embrace that sort of spirit of, I'm going to dig into the back of your skull and smear it on the wall. That's the attitude that makes little knives work. And most knives, really. But, you know, like we said before, you know, try to ram it into the guy's spine from the front. And tissue compression will also let you do quite a bit more damage than you might think with a small yeah, you know, blade design. Depending on the blade design, yeah. Are uh, we moving into the blade design? Uh, we can go there next. Anybody have any questions before we actually do wrap up handle design this time? Questions, snide remarks? Sure. Well, is there a ratio of width, thickness, and the handle that works the best? Is there like kind of a mean? There might be, but. One to two? Yeah, I think that one to two is probably pretty uh, safe. Twice roughly twice as wide as it is thick. Yeah. With allowances, of course, for things like finger grooves and things yeah. like that. 
let's say this probably has a 1 to 2 ratio through here, and then not quite so much through here, but this is still wider than it is thin. Anybody else? No? Moving right along. So blade design. Um, thrusting works. A thrust wounds work. Slashes, you might get lucky. So let's talk about what happens when you apply a knife against a surface, whatever that surface may be. When you cut with, this is a fairly conventional edge shape here. When you're cutting against something, you're pushing at it. With a broad surface like an edge, what you're doing is distributing the energy of that motion across that entire surface where it makes contact. So while on a slash you might get a cut, the depth of that cut is going to vary heavily depending on the toughness of the material you're cutting. Size if, of the blade. Size of the blade, the weight behind it, also whether or not whatever you're cutting is not going to move or if it's going to move away from you as you're cutting it. In a combative application, if you're cutting a person, unless you have them up against the wall, they're probably moving as you're cutting. So when you slash, you're working against something, distributing this energy across this entire blade, and you're pushing it away as it's also being able to move away, whether it's an arm or a body or something like that. People tend to not stand still when you're doing stuff like that. Good. With the thrust, you're concentrating all the force of your action entirely on the point, and you're guaranteeing, to some extent, that you're going to get more depth than on a cut. When you cut at something and push it away, you might get an inch, you might get an eighth of an inch. It's variable. What are they wearing? Are they dressed like we're dressed right now? Are they wearing a heavy, like a motorcycle cop's jacket? You might be there a while even trying to get a cut through heavy leather. With the thrust, you're putting all that energy on the point, and you're guaranteeing some amount of depth. The thing with depth, it's like penetration in handgun rounds or rifle rounds. The things you want to hit to stop a human being being aggressive towards you are within the body. They're not on the surface. There's the idea that you can cut certain muscle groups and stop somebody from moving. There's also a wealth of medical evidence that this really doesn't work and a wealth of anecdotal evidence that this doesn't really work. Yeah, I kind of wish Paul Sharp. Yeah, there. unfortunately Paul Sharp is busy teaching a block right now, but he has a pretty good story about an arrest he made of a gentleman who was on bath salts. At the time Paul encountered the guy, he was cut very badly down his arms. He had self-inflicted yeah, cuts self into the muscle, to the bone, down the length of his arm. According to proponents of biomechanical cutting, the idea of cutting muscle groups to stop people from being violent aggressors, that should have stopped him from being able to use his arms. Paul ended up fighting with this guy for a fairly extended period of time trying to get him arrested. It was like 20 minutes. Trying to get handcuffs on him. Something just ridiculous. Yeah. Had no, another there was officer there. Paul and another officer yeah. there. And for the, the I'm sure most of you at this point have at least seen Paul around here. He's the vanilla gorilla. You know, big dude, not somebody anybody wants to tangle with, not somebody you would think would have to take that long time to get somebody in a pair of handcuffs. Particularly if biomechanical cutting, cutting of muscle groups was an effective stop. And it's really not. So what we're looking at is having to put the point within the body to hit things we want to hit to stop people. Organs, elements of the central nervous system. And I mean, you're not going to be taking off somebody's limb with a four-inch knife. Not with stuff. You see techniques rooted in tradition. Um, Most people don't carry something this size. Defanging Nothing techniques. from you, William. You're special. <laughs> Defanging techniques intended to stop somebody from using that hand. What Probably most of those techniques were designed to work with was something like this, a large heavy chopping knife. If you kept, catch somebody across the arm with this, you're probably going to take a, at least a very deep cut in the arm, if not take off the arm or part of the hand. If, on the other hand, I try that with this, I might make an ugly cut, but it's probably not going to stop you. Defangs, biomechanical cutting are largely a myth until you start getting up into very large blades. So you want to stop somebody from being able to use the limb with an edge weapon, cut the limb off. 
or cut it so very deeply that the bone is compromised. Beyond that, you're not going to have a lot of luck doing anything other than damaging your ability to use it at best. And that's where things like hooking and shearing techniques come in, where you can get a very aggressive cut and pull into them instead of push them away from them. And you see blades designed for doing that, like the reverse edge knives we show here. So, um, again, any knife can be used defensively. I mean, we see this all the time in various criminal cases. Well, any pointy thing. So, yeah. this little thing, some kind of a, a cotter pin or something like that. I found this in a parking lot in front of a really shady supermarket mm -hmm. in the area of Albuquerque, commonly known as the War Zone. City official tell you it's the international district. But I found it on the sidewalk where the drunks and the bombs are usually passed out. It was just as pointy when I found it, and just as wrapped in electrical tape as it is now. The only difference is it had blood on it. Of course, being the person I am, I put on rubber gloves and picked it up and took it home and washed it because it's a great example. You can stab somebody to death with this. It's pointy. You have to work at it. You have to work at it, but it's pointy. It's all you really need. Um, I would say that not all knives are ideal. Morgan will get out of the way. No. That's a perfect example of something that's way too over-designed. It's the uh, Yacht Commando. Microtech? Can you mark me on it? Microtech. Can't quite see. This blade is it's machined and it's twisted. It's actually it's yeah, a spiral point. twist. Um, also, also screws on, on sheathing, sheet. it requires you to unscrew it several turns to actually pull it out of the sheet. Hold on. No, stop trying to keep it. Not ideal, um, but again, like we're, what we're basically saying is that focus really should be on tools that are de optimized primarily for thrusting. Like you could stab somebody with this. It's not really ideal. It's kind of broad in the front, and it's not really a good, well, stabbing profile. Chopping, sure. That's what these things are designed for. It's great. And, and, and Big blades, like we were saying, you have some leeway there. You can carry a big blade to carry a chop. Even the gentleman in the room who carries a very large knife, it's a very good thrusting knife. Yeah. Exactly. Next one, please. So, cutting ability. It almost goes without saying, but a sharp blade, it's going to do a better job than one that's dull. You're going to be able to cut deeper with less effort. It's even like scalpels are sharp. Even relative to a thrusting weapon, having sharp edges, that as you're thrusting, these edges are opening up that tissue because they're sharp, it's better than simply having something that makes a pull. It also allows you, on that arc of your thrust, to get a pulling motion in there, or a pushing motion, and light and that cut as you're coming back out. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what, what makes a knife sharp. Uh, the reality of it is it's all about geometry. How acute is the angle of the edge itself? And how much material is behind that edge to induce drag when you're cutting through material? Um, but the reality of it is the actual sharpness itself is entirely dependent on that angle. And these various grinds really don't make a difference on how sharp it is. Next one, please. So here's Somebody an shoot that example of various grinds. Starting from the left, that's a zero grind, a full flat zero grind, basically meaning that the entire knife is basically an edge bevel. There is no secondary bevel. It just comes down and goes straight up to the point. These can be extremely sharp. Um, but they always tend to be kind of, kind of fragile. There's not a lot of material. Is, is, is everybody clear what we're talking about with primary and secondary bevels relative to the edge? So, okay. Uh, the next one is more of a saber grind or scanty grind. It's kind of the same thing. There's a zero grind in the sense that it just goes down and meets to the very edge itself, no secondary bevel. One after that is a convex grind. Again, no secondary bevel. Is 
all the way. The difference being that the convex prime instead of being a straight, you have this slight curvature for various applications. <coughs> that shape, that cross section can be better. It allows certain materials. Your, yeah, certain materials allows the separation of material very well, keeping pressure off the edge for a smooth cut. You see a lot of bushcraft knives and also a lot of custom hunting knives and kitchen knives that use a convex cutter. Also a lot of large chopping knives that work very well in the settings. And it's not a bad option for a This was hollow grind. Hollow grinds are generally okay. Um, not awesome for heavy chopping. They cut very well because there's not it's a not lot of material in here. So when you're cutting, you have a real lack of friction acting on the blade because you're not trying to push a thick piece of material through whatever cut you're making. So they cut very well. Straight razor is a good example of this. Straight razor is traditionally hollow ground, at least mm -hmm. European and American straight razor. Usually. Sure. The last one, of course, is the infamous chisel grind. Uh, this is like the darling of the tactical world. Entirely flat, beveled on one side, and single side. Uh, you will hear a lot of people say that the chisel grinds are sharp. No. It's, it's again all by hand. All kinds of contrast. Slide. Go away. No, um, very Barely. No. I have to show you guys after. Come around and actually look at it on the monitor. Basically, what that what that shows you is one bevel that appears chisel ground and one that appears oh, B grind. Back one slide. Yeah. So we look at this chisel grind here, and let's just get about everything up here. That looks, if you look at it right, like a B grind that's simply been cocked up side of it. It's no more acute and no more capable of being acute than a B grind ground. Same They're both ground to, say, for instance, a 20 degree inclusive angle. So that means if you actually measure it, it would be 20 degrees total if you put a protractor on so it. This knife has a, a high flat grind that goes all the way up to the spine. If you look at it straight on, you can see that it has a V grind. If you turn it just slightly, oh, it's a chisel grind. There's no great performance. The edge angle is the same, both equally sharp. Either one is going to be. And there's no real strength increase in just the front, which one the other front. None. And one more. You can't see that. Okay, so any questions, Before comments, we things the we didn't get to on blade shape geometry that you're curious about? Is there an advantage to a chisel going for slicing? In very specialized applications like woodworking, sure. That's why chisel and ground that way because they work great for making uh, sushi knives. Give them a kind of cut. Yes. But, but yeah. 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 There's some advantage to that when you want to control having a very precise flat surface, what you're cutting away, leaving a very precise flat surface. Other than that, yeah, I mean, if you, I don't know if any of you guys have ever done any kind of woodworking. But if you try to do or use something like a standard B grind, B ground knife as a chisel, you tend to gouge or control it. Whereas a chisel is going to leave a very flat surface behind, a much more controllable curve or shaving. Yeah. yeah. I are a blacksmith. Don't ask me. But I found that. That's for woodwork. Yeah. This does, it means next to nothing when it comes to combative applications. Or even utility in general. You see a lot of people like, oh, <laughs> one, one of my complaints about chisel ground blades, and also you see some edges that are chisel ground on an otherwise B ground knife, is that it actually can control where that edge goes if you're trying to do very straight cutting in certain materials that you're not trying to leave that very precise edge on. Now, you're talking about grind, and I may be getting ahead of the presentation, but are you going to talk about blade shape as well? Well, that was more what we were talking about with the thrusting versus slashing. Oh, so we can, okay. well, let's back that up a little bit and talk about that. Um, ideal blade shape for combative applications. Yes. 
my take on that is you want a knife that has a point that's somewhere between, let's call this side of the knife the top line, and this side of the knife the bottom line, and in the exact middle of that would be the middle line. You want to point it somewhere between the top line and the middle line, or on the middle line of the blade. Now the reason for that being, let's say that this knife has, again, I'm going to pretend the edge on this is up since I like edge up to a little If I'm trying to thrust with this, and this point is low, what's happening is I'm starting to try and force the back of this blade into the material I'm trying to penetrate, instead of hitting on the point and really opening it up. What you want is you want a point that's going to hit along the center of that thrusting arc. So you're getting all that force well centered on the point of the knife, so it can then open up and start going. That's well, pretty much the same thing we were talking about before with push daggers versus. Um, you want to hit. If you are very committed to having a slashing knife rather than a thrusting tool, my recommendation is for something with a hawk bill or a hook blade on it. Yeah. Something that has a point that's going to be the first thing that hits when you make that cut. The way the points on these knives sit, when I slash, rather than hitting with the edge, as I would if I slash with this knife, I slash with this knife, I'm hitting with the edge more than the point. With this knife, I'm going to be hitting with the point. The point essentially acts like a small thrust and it creates an opening that I'm opening on up with the rest of that cut. That's a good slashing knife for defensive purposes. It will get deeper on a slash than making a swipe with something like this because it starts with that point and it opens up from there. It still won't be thrust deep, but it is something. The other, the reverse is also true in terms of talking about having your point too low and trying to push material into the into a wound you haven't created yet. If your point is too high, you start having a problem on a thrust that you have on a slash. You're starting to distribute all your energy across this broad surface instead of on the point because you're hitting that first instead. You see a lot of times you have a very upswept point on a thrust. If that point is too high to be in line with that thrust, you have the same effect where you're trying to get this broad thing through the material of your staff. This is actually a, this is a mock up of one of the knives I make. Um, at first glance, this might look like the point is too high. But once you actually put it in your hand and locks into your hand, it always hits with the point first for all the various stabs. Because the point is actually in the midline. Lines up pretty much perfectly with the rear of the hand. That's the center line of the knife. So when you go to stab something, Nothing wrong with recurve or something wasp wasted, but if you 
start getting into sudden broad protrusions, necking back in, sharp angles. You're looking at a tool that's going to cut inefficiently, and a tool also that risks hanging up on various materials you might encounter. Things like belts, zippers, yada yada. Oh. So it'd be safe to say keep serrations off of fighting knife all together. I mean, I'm not a fan of serrations in general because a properly sharp edge, honestly, will do most of the work that serrations will. Um, again, scalpels generally are not serrated. I'm exactly. I've uh, seen serrated knives get hung up on nylon. Right. Yeah. The, not a yeah, the issue yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And honestly, most people that carry a serrated knife carry it because they're too damn lazy to sharpen. I mean, that's like the, the cold steel serrations with the little tiny thing. It's like a Ginsu knife. What the serrations ever essentially do is they're just mic they're micro points and they create tiny little punctures mm -hmm. as you try to cut that you're then essentially ripping through. It's like, if you take a, a comb, a metal comb, you can cut or saw with a metal comb. Serrations are just doing that on a smaller, slightly sharper scale. They're so, not actually super sharp. Not, not, not a fan of serrations. Honestly, even, even on a utility knife, unless the only thing you ever cut is rope, if you are, you know, a sailor or something like that, by all means, carry a serrated knife. But if you cut anything other than that, you're going to hate those serrations. Especially once you start trying to get into utility or something like that, where you're, you're trying to cut in here, we have control over it, like for doing fuzz sticks or fire starting. But you really don't want serrations right there. It's just a pain in the ass to work around. So, yeah, keep serrations off knives in general, with a few specific exceptions. But, but it, as a specialized tool for cutting rope, serrations are right. good. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay. But they're, they are exactly like you say, specialized tool rather than the generalist tool that are commonly promoted in the sense. And that's the problem that you see. Promoting it is this great generalist thing and they're really not. So, did that help you out? Yes. Actually, right. Sorry we skipped over that. Earlier. Anybody else? Before we move on to the center line and the high line, what about Tom? I'm not a huge Tonto fan, mainly because I don't like that sharp corner right there. I think it inhibits good cutting ability for generalist tasks. I also think the way most Tontos are ground, it doesn't give you any kind of a, a focal point for opening up on a slash. Now there are plenty of Tontos that the point rises higher than the entire spine of the knife. I dislike those entirely for a defensive knife. Ones that dip down and the point does not rise higher than that, rough top line again. They thrust very well, again realizing you have this very acute angle there that's a little bit broader than a smooth curve would be. And you're trying to force that material even sharp into your into your cut. So I'm not a big Tonto guy. I also have some real problems from a design standpoint with uh, what we typically call the Tonto here in the US. What we typically call the Tonto here is this very acute angle, two separate bevels. Uh, if you go and look at actual Japanese Tontos, they have this very smooth curve up to a point with a grind that's compound, but no change in the angle of the edge. It's, it's a really smooth curve. The, the, the very angular, geometric Tonto is thoroughly an American invention. And the, the excellent yeah. American knife maker, Bob Lum, pioneered the American Tonto in the 70s. Oh. 70s or 80s. With these very visible compound grinds and then edges that still for a smooth curve. Other knife makers looking at this saw the very visible compound grind and translated that into having two different edge angles and started making these very hard angle condos. And, and the irony is that if you actually try to compare penetration ability, <coughs> Tonto is one of the worst at that. There's various components of the Tonto, cold steels notorious videos showing them going through car doors and things like this, and one from one of Columbia River's designers showing his Tonto point being the most superior penetrator ever. Essentially their stage. If you were to go and replicate those in an uh, unbiased environment, you'd find a better penetration, better penetration from 
blades have smoother curves and don't have these hard angles. I mean, the, the, the car door thing, I mean, that's cool. But when did you get to that car door line? I, that's one thing, but I could put this through a car door. Not Tonto. You had your hand up second no. here? Oh, I was just, I wanted to make the distinction as well between American okay. Tonto and Japanese. Gotcha. Um, there are plenty of more traditional Tontos that don't have a point that rises up too high again. I think those are fantastic. They've got a narrow front. They cut very well. They thrust very well. So. Did that help you out with the Tonto question? Awesome. Okay, good. Anything else before we move on to materials? No? Good. 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 Materials. Okay, so cutting ability and toughness. Steel is basically the standard by which everything else is measured uh, when it comes to cutting the building and toughness. There's a reason we use steel for so many different things, it's because it's really the best compromise for most of these buildings. Uh, cutting ability is sort of a sort of a mix between hardness and toughness. You kind of have to trade one for the other, which is the harder something gets, the more brittle it tends to be. It's really brittle, then, well, the edge is not going to last very long, even though it might be very, very hard. For example, that would be a glass knife. You could get an incredibly sharp edge on glass, obsidian, things like this. But if you take that knife, that incredibly sharp edge, and you slam it into another person in a fight, you're probably going to shatter it, even on tissue. You're going to see chipping, you're going to see significant damage to it. Still kind of want to learn plant damage just to make it obsidian. One of the common things you see with lithic tools, lithic being stone, ancient knives made from stone, is you almost never find them intact. The knife we showed earlier, Otsi's knife, actually has the point broken and it has damaged the edges. And it's thought by some that that may have actually happened in the fight that led to his death. He was murdered. He had an arrow in him been aggressively attacked and harried up this mountain where they eventually found his body. But that's, and that's another thing with the, with the stone knives like that is that even you know, Utsi actually carried a tool specifically to sharpen his knife. There's a way to swallow a napping tool so he could pressure flake off and renew the edge on that plate. Which also tells you something about how they used it. And how often it needed to be yeah. done. So hardness is great but it still needs to be, pardon the pun, tempered with toughness. And that's how you actually get a longer lasting edge, is having a steel that is both tough and hard. So, and you see this with some of the super alloys today, but honestly for defensive use, if you stab somebody so many times that your knife becomes dull, you might want to check your life choices somewhere along the way. Okay? That happens so often that you need to repeatedly sharpen that knife. Especially yeah. if it's a dedicated defensive piece. Like the stuff I make is really designed to be, oh shit, this is it. And you're not going to be opening your mail with it or cutting, cutting twine when you can, but that's not really what the intent is. I'll make stuff to pry open ammo crates. Buy a strider or a crowbar. Um, so there's <coughs> hundreds of different alloys. Several dozens of them are commonly used for knives. We're not going to touch on all of them. Way too many for you. We're going to give you some basic guidelines, basically, and that's going to start with at least 440 series, which means 440A, uh, 440B, and, and of course C. One of the most common knife steels you'll see, particularly in cheaper knives, is 420J or 420J2. You see a ton of knives made out of it. That might look all right, but that steel is garbage and trash. You want, at a minimum, 440 series, A through C. A is eh, B is all right, and C, at one point, there's a premium crop for us, the knife world, and A more is just kind of a, okay, yeah, steel. Yeah. 440 C first hit the market, that was... It was a super steel. It was considered a super steel. And you do not need to have carbon steel in order to make a good knife. That's a, a long-standing myth that the only good knives and the only knives that get really sharp are high carbon steel. The origin of that myth goes back to when stainless was first being introduced. It did not harden 
in ways that most of the knife makers in this country, who were coming from very traditional styles of craftsmanship, particularly custom knife makers, who were coming from a, a long line of essentially traditional blacksmiths, it didn't harden in ways that they understood or ways that they could reproduce. And many of the early grades of stainless were not performance steel. What they did was not rust as readily as other steels that were available. That's all they did. And in some cases, there were very hodgepodge of ingredients to get that particular effect. Good cutlery grade stainless steels came along fairly quickly, but the myth had already been put into essentially the American knife world that you have to have carbon steel, high carbon tool steel, to get a good edge. That's entirely untrue. All of the requirements for a good edge can be found in modern stainless cutlery steel. Every chemical ingredient necessary, every property you want, is available in any of the modern stainless steel. And even in, again, you get into super steels, like ZDP 189 or something, where you get these super, super hard steels that still retain a good deal of toughness. But they're also Not expensive. to say carbon steels are bad, it's just no. they're both equal. They're just different. We can all accomplish the goal that we're all trying to get to. Uh, next one. So specialty metals, uh, most commonly used is probably, and this is one I use a lot myself obviously, it is titanium. Um, you see a lot of different grades being used. If you see anything, any knife that's made out of commercially pure or CP titanium, don't buy it, because it's probably gonna suck. CP titanium is extremely soft, and really does not make for a very good knife. The one I use most commonly is 6AL4B, also known as grade 5. Uh, it gets to be about 36, 38 on the Rockwell scale, Rockwell C. No, uh, soft. Good steel knife is going to be 58 to 60 on the Rockwell C scale. 56, maybe. 56, yeah. So, again, titanium is soft. That's why it's not really good for utility. That's why I don't recommend it for that. Um, but it holds an edge and gets sharp enough to where it'll last long enough to you know, do what it needs to do in a defensive application. Again, if your knife gets dull, but you're doing it so often, yeah, life choice is not good. Um, some more exotic things, uh, stellite. Stellite is an industrial alloy like most knife alloys really are. Uh, use a lot for bearings, high temperature applications, it's a uh, cobalt chromium uh, alloy. It's a giant pain in the ass to work with. It's also super, super expensive. Uh, you don't really want to know how expensive. It's just bring the big boy wallet if you ever want to sell it. Uh, beryllium bronze is used for uh, primarily non-sparking tools for use in hazardous environments. Strider has used beryllium bronze a few times. Most of the big industrial tool companies have at least some beryllium bronze safety tools for volatile environments. Yeah, unlike Mick Strider, I'm not going to work with beryllium bronze because that's like breathing. That's thing. cancer. <laughs> the, the, the dust is very, enormously very hazardous. So, yeah, you really don't want to mess with that at all. Um, SM100 is a relatively new entry. It's actually uh, also known as Nitinol 60, was developed by DARPA. Again, for <coughs> very specific applications, but we found out that you can actually take what's, in a, a tit what's essentially a titanium and nickel alloy and harden it to 62 Rockwell, which is very much on the high end, and actually get a non-ferrous blade that behaves a lot like steel but can't rust, period. Like any environment that'll rust an SM100 knife will kill you immediately. So, yeah. But again, like Stellite, it's really, really expensive. And only possibly really. Uh, carbide, tons of carbide. You don't see a whole lot of knives made from it. You see it a lot more made, uh, made or used in industrial applications like uh, the saw tips, or sawtooth tips, and so on. What you do see with knives is embedding it into right. edges on soft metals like titanium. 
Yeah, and that's that's what I do, and that's what I'm not going to think of. That's one, it's something that's been used in machining for a very long time. Uh, we use it for a lot of lathe tooling, basically to sort of enhance the lifespan of the lathe tools. Uh, Warren Thomas was probably the first one that used it for actual knives. And you basically, you embed carbide particles into the titanium. And the idea is the titanium will soft will wear away before the carbide does. So you're constantly exposing fresh carbide. So it becomes almost self sharpening Is it strictly necessary for a defensive knife? Yeah. No. I have to do it because it does give you that little bit of extra edge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're all trade-offs. None of them offer what, the, what steel actually does as far as cutting into the end toughness. Yeah. Um, ceramic or uh, hard polymer? Okay. Uh, so if you want utility, you really should be looking at steel. That's what you do for a work knife or a bushcraft knife. That's really your best option. If you want a knife that is going to fill a defensive role that you're going to be using for stuff every day, steel. Steel's the way to go. Because. Shall we truck on to yeah. other materials? Yep. Next slide, please. So, non metallic materials. Um, primary purpose for using non metallic materials for a knife is to avoid detection or corrosion. Because there's no metal in them, they're not going to corrode. In most environments that they'll survive in, uh, will survive. Uh, but really it's just a way of getting around detection and getting into non-permissive environments, courthouses, um, or any, pretty much any place that wants to restrict your ability to defend yourself. And that uses metal detectors. The metal detectors. Now, You'll know that there's a difference between a magnetometer and a metal detector. The vast majority of places they will use metal detectors, uh, not a magnetometer. Magnetometers basically only really detect ferrous metals. They're not so good at detecting other kinds of metals, such as titanium, bronze, etc. Um, but magnetometers are almost extinct at this point. You have to find someone who's been really, really cheap for the last couple of decades. Still have a magnetometer in uh, Common non metallics, Cytel. Uh, it's a glass fiber reinforced nylon. Material. It's kind of soft. Handle is made out of a lot like spider crow handles, a lot of injectable plastic type handles. Yeah. It's a Zytel or similar type of plastic. Uh, Cold Steel's Corribery is basically Cytel, a proprietary version. When you easy. take it down to an edge, that edge folds very, very easily and doesn't retain any real cutting ability. You stab it. You stab it. But cutting with it is anything more than a cut on paper, and even then you're going to have edge rolling and deformation. Uh, various variations on that same thing, like Zytel or reinforced plastic. Carbon fiber. Um, carbon fiber, along with G10, Probably the best polymer options for non-metallic knives. Um, carbon fiber can actually get fairly sharp, and it's sharp enough to where you can like, cut paper. Having specialized in non-metallic knives for about 10 years now. Did you see Raquel's? Which one? The little dagger? I don't think so. She's oh, hiding. G10, which is commonly used for knife handles, just like carbon fiber is. G10. The base fiber in that material is only slightly stiff. It is stiffer on ground to an edge than Zytel and other plastics. It will allow for some cutting ability, but it is again primarily a thrusting tool. Mm -hmm. Carbon fiber, on the other hand, is very stiff. When you grind it to an edge, it will retain that edge for several cuts, even in the meat, even on first. It's stiff, but it's also brittle. You see those small fibers at the edge beginning to break off, and you see edge deformation from that but you retain almost a micro serration effect, allowing you to make effective cuts, particularly if you're using violence. But again, most of those are really going to be best suited for stabbing. They are, they are a very specialized tool, and <coughs> like you said, best suited for stabbing. 
and for most people's needs, most people's uses, there's no real reason for that. If you do regularly travel in a, an NP, a non-permissive environment, and you want to be armed in some fashion, that's where that kind of tool starts to come in. So, in ceramic, you're asking about, uh, so we're carrying that Stone River one, right? Um, it's really, really, really hard. Like, pretty much the only thing really harder than ceramic is be diamond. But it's also not very tough. So it tends to be very brittle. Um, the problem with combative applications there is that it's almost impossible to make it so that you don't have any kind of lateral impact or force on the blade. And a blade of any kind of decent length is going to be very easy to snap, unless it's very thick. And the thicker it gets, uh, the worse it cuts, generally speaking. And harder to carry and seal. So it's also somewhat expensive, or can be. Uh, Snow River options like what we have is probably some of the cheaper versions of it. Uh, I've done some ceramic laminates, which we'll touch on here really, really briefly, and I can't do it as well as me. The tooling is just too expensive for somebody on my scale. They're churning out thousands on thousands of them. They can do it a lot cheaper. Uh, next slide, please. So, this is kind of where we get into the laminates. Um, yeah, we've got a little bit. Um, I try to get around some of the issues with the sort of brittle nature of ceramic by actually laminating with carbon fiber. So the carbon fiber is a very rigid, a very rigid laminate. It helps sort of prevent too much of that force being applied directly to the ceramic. So you have to work a lot harder for it. You just can't do it. It takes a lot more effort. Um, they're still lightweight and they're stronger, but again, it's very specialized to work. Not something I'd recommend for general use. They do, however, cut for an enormously long time. You'll see people using ceramic kitchen knives if they're taking care of them. They can cut with them literally for years. Um, I'm not sure how many surgical applications there are for ceramic blades. I think it's seen a little bit of use, but not much. I've heard of some use, but most of the time there's still steel and then <coughs> either, either disposable stuff or send the steel out to be sharp. Yeah, right. And some of the specialty blades like the microkeratones and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah she's like diamond, I think. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. that's above my degree. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it goes for all of us. Uh, of course, there's also, the titanium carbon fiber laminates like what I make, um, which was pioneered originally by Warren Thomas. Um, basically, you take a titanium core, a relatively thin titanium core, and you laminate it to carbon fiber. The benefit there is that you get both the advantages of the lightweight nature of the carbon fiber and the edge holding of you know, titanium or, or the actual ceramic. And of course, ceramic doesn't rust. Titanium won't rust in any atmosphere, but it won't kill you immediately. So if you want something you can carry all the time and not ever have to worry about cleaning it or really doing any kind of maintenance to it, those materials work well for that, but not for utility. Are you waving at a fly or do you have your hand Fine. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, Next slide, this might actually be good. Yep, uh, questions? Uh, also, if you guys want to come up and look at this stuff and actually see what we're talking about. This I know it seems like the part of this lecture is to kind of have people explore on their own, but is there any recommendations that you guys have for methods of carry, for instance, the type of work in your body? <coughs> methods of carry? Um, and of course, um, specific knives. Near the center line. Near the center line. Um, fixed blades, particularly near the center line. Or you can like get to them with a locked wrist, similar to yeah, the way I was carrying the side either way, the way either hand. Ian carries his. Or when you reach for that knife, it's somewhere forward of your hips. You know? So you're not having to reach behind you. You're not having to engage any kind of real lifting of the shoulder. Something can be impeded by being on the ground or up against the wall or having somebody wrapped around you. Right here, I can get on the handle of any knife I have from about here to about here with very minimal involvement on my shoulder just by 
and start doing Turn something to get somebody off. Well, not off, off of me. Um, hopefully it doesn't get me off. Anything further back than that, again, you start engaging your shoulders, you start having to pick up, you start having to move around behind you, and that can be problematic. The locked wrist component, you don't want, unless it's in extremis, it's the only way you can get to it, you don't want as a fault to be having to bend your wrist significantly to draw that tool. So even forward of the hip, if you've got something straight up and down, you want to draw it into a forward grip, you have to bend that wrist. Now if you want to draw into a reverse grip from here, that's fine, but for forward grip, having it horizontal so you can keep that wrist locked and keep the strength in your grip. Going back to establishing a full fighting grip, or what the late Paul Nomads often call a fucking fighting grip. You want that wrist to be locked. So anywhere you can establish that with whatever your preferred draw is, for whatever tool you're carrying or decide to carry, forward of the hip, reverse grip, forward grip, it depends on what you want to do, and also to be able to get to it with either hand. With this hand, I can hit this with the locked wrist, and then if I have to, I can minimally articulate my wrist to get into a reverse grip. Same if I put it here for primary for reverse grip, minimal articulation of the wrist versus extreme. Those are things I look for, things I recommend, is to have that ability to get to it with either hand with a primarily locked wrist or minimally articulated wrist. Folder carry. You can carry folders in on your center line, either behind your belt or in your waistband. Access is going to be slower than in your pocket because you're going to have to clear your garment and get your thumb inside your waistband or behind your belt, get the folder out and begin articulating it. If you're carrying a waved folder, that deployment's a little bit hard from back there. For those of you who aren't familiar with waved folders, it's a device invented by our distinguished of Emerson Knives that's now being offered on a variety of fashions. It catches on a pocket when you draw and snaps the blade open. This is one bolt on, all the sort of stuff that Ian makes. If you're deploying that from inside the pants, catching that on the pants of the belt is somewhat unreliable, and you end up with your wrist at this kind of angle to deploy it. In the pocket, I tend to prefer to draw into a reverse grip the folder that has a wave on it, because I can simply pull up and forward and roll the knife in. Or if I don't want edge in, I start pull up the door of the folder. You can also carry a wave knife so that it deploys rearward. Flip it on the pocket, stick your thumb in, index it, and pull back. My problem with that being you have to move that hand back. If you carry it high in the pocket, on a slash pocket, it tends to want to drop on a more blue jeans type pocket. You can carry it a little far forward, but that hook has to be big enough that you can simply just turn it outboard and index that part of the pocket hot. A lot of them aren't blood and you have to pull them all the way to the rear of the pocket to catch. I still prefer if you're carrying a folder, have a wave or some type of catch on it, because otherwise you have to pull it out, then articulate it, and then get your hand on the knife. That becomes problematic under pressure. If you do knife combatives training, you'll see a lot of people, that's where they break down. It's getting, if you're working access under any kind of pressure, Getting that folder out, getting your thumb on it, getting it forward, and getting a full grip on it. And there's a lot of folders, folder trainers that have <coughs> gone skittering across flying. the floor at an ECQC. A wave type device makes that easier something. because it brings that draw stroke closer to that of a fixed blade. Um, folders are still less than ideal. Fixed blades end up being the most ideal. The other thing I'm going to throw out real quick for people is my thought on if you have to thumb open a folder. If you thumb open a folder, whether or not you prefer a downward or an upward edge orientation. There's a very tenuous position here. Once this is open, to turn it in the hand using your fingers, getting on the handle right there and turning the knife to get it in a downward edge presentation. Fuck that noise. Open that and move your thumb right there and you have a fighting grip. It may not be your ideal orientation, but it's one that works and it's faster to get to without this fiddly shit. That's what I recommend if you're thumb opening a folder. So just move that thumb over and lock it down. And that's what I recommend people train if they're limited to carrying a folder or prefer carrying a folder for combative use and want to stick to a thumb opening. That's my recommendation. Shoot. Well, talking about fixed plates, how many states allow fixed plates for self defense right now? How many states allow self defense? It's not a bad question. <laughs> um, I don't know off the top of my head. There's several resources online that will. 
uh, that can talk about that. Um, NiceLaws.org, nice laws I think yeah. it is. Many states don't. Yeah. Um, many states do. Um, it just depends. Some states allow it if you have a concealed carry permit. Some states have no real law about it on the books. Some states have a vague, it ends up being a gray area. You need to decide what you're comfortable with personally. Personally, I will carry what I need to to have the most advantage to protect myself and my family. So, for instance, New Mexico, where we're both from, um, their definition of a dagger is so big as to include any implement that you use to stab somebody with. Screwdriver, screwdriver, broken pocket, anything. Really, the intent is the only thing that really matters, so rather whether or not the prosecutor feels like declaring that you use an illegal weapon. So I carry a push dagger. Could I carry something single-edged? Sure. Am I guaranteed that the prosecutor is not going to say, that's a dagger? No. no. Not even a little You need to find out what you're comfortable with or figure out what you're comfortable with and then find out what your state's laws are. So that at the very least, you have some idea of what to expect if you're involved in a defensive altercation using a knife. You should probably expect some kind of ungodly turmoil simply because we as humans have a very visceral reaction to knives used as weapons. It's been done for as long as we've been human and it's ingrained. We have this thing about being cut or being stabbed. People have very visceral negative reactions to it. Well, there have been Springer touched on that. Yeah. yeah. There have been I'd rather get shot. <laughs> yeah. Very clear cut cases. Get shot and get stabbed. No, that's not true. You'd much rather get stabbed. There have been very clear cut cases of self defense using small gentleman's knives where the person was prosecuted simply because of the appearance of such great violence because of having used a knife. Yeah. Find out what the laws are. Pay attention to what goes, comes across the news, what the environment might be, where you are regarding that kind of self defense, and at the very least be prepared for the kind of crap we'll have to deal with. Knives are a really good problem-solving tool. They solve problems that can't always be solved with a gun. They solve problems in close proximity of access and ability to open up your ability to get to a gun or get somebody away from you to get the hell out of there. You might not be able to if you only have one tool or you only have your fists. They're problem solvers. I prefer them as part of my profile, not in isolation, as part of having a gun having pepper spray, having an impact weapon. They're part of my profile, but they are a great problem solver within that profile. Yeah. Any other questions? What are your guys' thoughts on carrying like a fixed blade on a static sheet? A cord attached to a gun or your belt? It can, it can work. Um, you have to be kind of particular about how you set it up, and ideally the sheet should have something on it so that it, it doesn't uh, doesn't lose float around or getting stolen. Yeah, I was going to hold up. Best For those who don't know what he's talking about, he's talking about having a sheet with a cord on you it. loop it around your belt. cord goes around the belt, and then when you draw the knife, the sheath partially comes with, pulls taut, and the knife comes through. Yeah, the biggest problem is you see a lot of them will, will just be straight kydex. The problem is kydex is relatively smooth. <coughs> so as you move throughout your day, it, it has a Anybody tendency to migrate. It has a rubber pad on the exterior. And that was, that's my solution. Um, I'll, I'll give you guys the, the insider secret. Trade secret here. This is mouse pad, like cloth mouse pad. This actually is from a, a huge bag of giveaway Animatrix mouse pads that I got when I worked at Circuit City years ago. <laughs> I had like five pounds of it. I've seen uh, Paul Howe, I'm sure you've heard of Paul Howe, he takes a uh, bet wrap, mm -hmm. and he puts a knot on it and just rolls it around so it's sticky. That would work just another. Yeah, you could probably do that. My, my, my biggest concern with something like so. vet wrap or Coban is that it breaks down over time. You'll keep. You'll have to keep reapplying it. Yeah. Uh, the mouse pad, or or other types of foam rubber or neoprene rubber, um, will tend to last a lot longer. Yeah. Eventually, it might wear down. When you guys come up here afterwards and start looking to see that there's some of the stuff that's worn off. Right. So well, it takes a long time. You don't have to come up and look at the pile of stuff we have. Feel free to gather around. Any other questions? Feel free to ask questions. We continue to do that. We can talk a little. There was a trainer that went around at some point. Oh,